Another high five. Woohoo. PM episode three. Welcome back to episode three of Paige and Micah in the PM, where we break down all things college and pro football. I'm host Paige Hunter. And I'm Micah Farmer. And I don't know you about you, Micah, but I'm very excited for this week's episode. A lot happened on the gridiron this past week, so let's dive right on in. So many notable games this past week, Micah. It was so hard just to choose four, so we're going to go with five. <laughs> Starting us off, the number 14 Utah Utes traveled to Southern California to take on number 18 USC in a shootout. The Utes made a field goal as time expired to upset the Trojans 34-24 and hand them their second loss in a row. What does this say about this USC team? This USC team has not had a defense all year, and now that they're starting to play really good teams that do have a defense that can slow down Caleb Williams, they're really starting to struggle. Caleb Williams now still remains winless versus Utah for his career, which is a weird stat. Utah's pretty really good, weird. but yeah. without Cam rising, you maybe would have expected USC to take this one. But Bryson Barnes played really well, going 14 of 23 for 235, throwing three touchdowns and only one interception. Mm -hmm. And when you're able to slow Caleb Williams down like the Utes were, that's really the recipe to beat USC because they don't have a defense. Yeah, and like you said, really good stats from their third-string quarterback. And unfortunately, Cam Rising is going to be out for the remainder of the season. Yeah, big loss for them. Big loss. But high hopes after that performance from Bryson Barnes. Um, I mean, we'll see what this Utah team can do the rest of the season, but not looking very good for USC. Over on the Atlantic coast, another great game to watch as the number four Florida State was able to hold off number 20 Duke in a win they got 38 to 20. This is a bit of a weird game. A lot of the early scoring came via defense and special teams with Jordan Travis throwing a pick six mm -hmm. and then Florida State getting a 99-yard kickoff return touchdown. But then in the second half, Riley Leonard goes down injured again. Mm -hmm. And from that point on, Florida State really had the game in the bag. They started to pull away. Jordan Travis, despite the pick six, I still think played well, going 27 of 36, throwing for 268 yards. He's kind of on that next tier of mm -hmm. your Heisman contenders right now to where he's not a favorite, but if a few other guys falter, he could be right there to pick up the pieces, especially if this Florida State team keeps playing the way they are right now. Yeah, lots of Heisman talk. I feel like this whole season there's kind of hasn't been a set you know, Heisman list, so I'm very interested to see when this full list comes out, who's up there and who's not. Uh, but like you said, just a bad night for the Blue Devil offense. Only 197 rushing yards and 76 receiving yards. Obviously, with the loss of Riley Leonard again, that's not going to help your offense. But just unfortunate after, you know, we saw them a couple weeks ago play really well and just kind of slowly going down just a little bit. Also in the ACC, a big upset as the Virginia Cavaliers traveled to Chapel Hill and beat the number 10 Tar Heels 31 to 27. Micah, this was a big game. And last week, you know, you gave us a really hot take about UNC winning the ACC title. How's that going now? I actually still think it's going just fine. Wow, because okay. Because Duke now has a conference loss, and so does North Carolina. They have the okay, same right. amount of conference losses. They can still make the title game. Drake May, I still think, played really well in this game. I know he threw an interception at the end that made North Carolina end up losing the game, but he got hit as he threw. I don't think you can really blame him too much for that interception. And I think you have to give credit to this Virginia team, showing mm -hmm. up prepared, ready to go. They were 1-5. They were not looking good mm -hmm. at all. And early in this game, you're like, okay, Virginia, keeping it close early. And then they just kept going and kept going. You're like, oh, are they going to pull this off? They ended up being able to. So a real fun game to mm -hmm. watch. Yeah, and a good game for UVA. They've had a bunch of close losses past week, and so they really need this one. The Tar Heels also really needed this one. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, you said they could still win out the ACC. We'll see if that happens. Over in the SEC, a big rivalry game as number 11 Alabama looked to avenge their previous season loss to number 17 Tennessee. After a nail biter of a game, the Tide got the win 34 to 20. Micah, what do we have to say about this game? Yeah, just some more schizophrenic Alabama this season. Yeah, how did they keep getting away with a it? A bad first half, and then the second half, a national title team shows up. And you're like, there where you did go. this come from? But Tennessee early, touchdown to Squirrel White, deep ball from Joe Milton. You're like, okay, Tennessee might embarrass Alabama at home. And then 
the third quarter came around and Alabama just completely started imposing mm -hmm. their will. Tennessee could not move the ball at all. And I think if this Alabama team can ever find a way to play a full game at the level they played that second half, they could be very dangerous come the end of the year. Mm -hmm. Do we think that they can make a CFP run or Well, not I mean, year? if they beat LSU, they're going to go to Atlanta for the SEC title game. And then if you have an SEC champion whose one loss is Texas, I think they do get in. But I don't know how successful they would be in the playoffs. Yeah, I think there's going to be have to be a lot to determine that, especially with you know a lot of the other current top six teams that we see. But we'll just have to wait and find out. And finally, going back to the West Coast, a low-scoring game that really surprised us all. The number five Washington Huskies barely survived Arizona State, 15 to seven. Yeah, the Washington offense in this one, despite being amazing all year long, was just frankly bad. Mm -hmm. They did not score a point via the offense. It was just field goals and then a pick six late in the game that gave them the lead. Michael Penix looked off in this one. Romo Dunze never really able to get going. And credit to the Arizona State defense for mm -hmm. that. They played really well, but unfortunately they just were not able to hold out the entire way. But I think this does hurt Michael Penix's Heisman I campaign a little bit. Mm -hmm. The two interceptions almost lost his team the game. So yeah. you really got to look at that and say, if a team is able to pressure Michael Penix, is he going to fall apart like this every time, or is he going to be able to bounce back? Yep. No, I 100% agree. So many good games. Now let's head over to the Conference Center and talk more about the Power Five and everything that happened within it. Over in the ACC, a close weekend. Uh, we talked about a couple games prior, but another good one was Clemson and Miami. Miami pulling away with the win 28-20 to in double overtime. Yeah, this was a weird game. Miami without Tyler Van Dyke, their starting quarterback in this one. And you think, okay, this Clemson defense is so good mm -hmm. that Miami with the backup quarterback is not going to be able to move the ball at all. And they ended up being able to move the ball. And then Clemson keeps turning it over in yeah. the red zone. They lead the FBS in fumbles. They cannot hold on to the football. It's coming back to bite them over and over mm -hmm. and over then on the last play of the game in double overtime, it was supposed to be just an inside zone run up the middle. Cade Klubnick keeps it, tries to do too much, is tackled on the outside. Clemson ends up losing the game. So I think you really have to look at that and say, if Klubnick isn't willing to stay within the offense when he is supposed to, how much can you trust him to keep running this offense in the future? How much can you trust him to be able to lead your team further into the season and go back to the Clemson that they used to be. And mm -hmm. I don't know how much you can trust Klubnick to be that guy at this point. Yeah, you know, Klubnick had a good game, uh, throwing for 314 yards, two touchdowns, one interception. But at the end of the night, it's the turnovers that cost them the game. Then also in the ACC, one game I do want to put a little bit of light on, Pitt lost to Wake Forest after upsetting Louisville the week before. Gave a lot of Pitt fans hope. They started to move forward and think, mm -hmm. okay, this team has some potential. And then they completely fell flat against Wake Forest, completely embarrassing. Wake Forest now without Sam Hartman is not the team they were before. And so for Pitt to drop that game, I think really knocks them back down a peg in the ACC. Yeah, and Pitt traveling to Notre Dame next weekend and coming off that huge win against USC and South Bend. We'll just have to see how this Pitt team fares against the Irish. And now over to the SEC. What is going on? So much happening in the SEC. We say this every week, but it's just not the SEC that we're normally used to. No, it's, it's fun. It's the it fun SEC. Fun. <laughs> Unless you're an Auburn fan. Oh, yeah. Because the Auburn Tigers have yet to find a person who can throw a football. Peyton Thorne did not look good. Robbie Asher was brought in, also did not look good. This Ole Miss defense, which has been Swiss cheese all year, looked like the 85 Bears against the Auburn passing attack. Just... Auburn has got to find a way to get mm -hmm. a consistent passing game going or else there's going to be a lot more games that end like this and even worse. Yeah, and we saw this against Georgia too, but for not having a consistent offense, you got to give the Tigers some credit. They're keeping the score crazy oh, close. The defense is a really good defense. Oh, yes. They just do not have the offense to no. win games. No, uh, that Ole Miss offense had 223 rushing yards, 202 receiving yards, but I mean, for this Ole Miss team being who they are and this Auburn team being who they are, the score shouldn't have been that close. We said the same about Georgia, but, I mean, just lots going on in the SEC. Yeah, I think you chalk that down to the Jordan-Hare environment. Auburn is able to keep it close with that. Yep, there we go. But a fun SEC like we talked about. Another big one was South Carolina at Missouri. South Carolina ended up losing. Missouri pulled away with the win, 34-12. to Micah, you know you love Missouri, so we'll give you your Micah's Mizzou Minute. Let's hear it. 
Brady Cook once again showed out. A lot of people have this as a trap game marked down for Missouri. Say maybe South Carolina goes in, they get into a shootout, Rattler overcomes it. Missouri defense said, no way that's happening. South Carolina was held to 12 points. This is looking like a more and more complete Missouri team every week. The defense plays better versus Kentucky a couple weeks ago. The offense proved it can win without a high-flying passing attack and without Luther Burden, which, who, by the way, was back on form going over 100 yards again in this game. So I think this Missouri team is very good. Everyone who knows me knows I love this Missouri yeah. team. And yeah. I still think they're upsetting Georgia when they play in a couple weeks. Well, I can't wait for that episode of Paige and Mike and the PM to see you're <laughs> all about it. Uh, but like you said, South Carolina getting no points from touchdowns. Uh, Spencer Radler, all the hype coming in with him. 217 yards, two interceptions. You just can't do that. And that's not going to win you games. No. Not scoring touchdowns is not going to win you games. Another big one, Mississippi State at Arkansas. Big another, disappointment, maybe. Another low-scoring game, 7-3. to three. Like, what is going on with these SEC teams and not being able to find the end zone? This is just pure offensive ineptitude. It's inexcusable from both sides. Will Rogers is supposedly a talented quarterback for the Bulldogs. Started to show it a couple years ago. Has never really developed. We know K.J. Jefferson is a good player, mm -hmm. and he is consistently wasted on terrible Arkansas play calling and terrible support from his supporting counsel. Past. And I think Sam Pittman knows that, hence why he fired his offensive coordinator, Dan Enos, after that game. So hopefully Arkansas can look to bounce back, but they've still got a tough schedule the rest of the way. Yeah, I mean, that three points, I'd probably fire him too. But moving on from the SEC, we're going to jump over to the Big 12. We had number eight, Texas, at Houston. Another nail-biter, 31-24, Texas. But... Some sad news, Queen Ewers hurt again. Um, before he came out though, he threw 23 for 29, 211 yards, two touchdowns, but I mean, what is this going to do to Texas? You know, this being a close game and now Quinn Ewers is out, what do you think this is going to do to that Texas team? Ewers is listed as week to week, so they could have him back later in the season. But I think people forget how good Malik Murphy is, the Texas backup quarterback. Has an absolute cannon for arm. Honestly, if you want to know what Malik Murphy is, think of a slightly more athletic Joe Milton. That's what you're going to get from Malik Murphy in Texas the rest of the year that Murphy's in. Ewers, once again, injury issues. You have to wonder if this is going to be a career thing for him, if he's going to have these injury issues for his entire time playing football. And it just stinks to see a guy that talented going down so often. But credit to Houston for mm -hmm. keeping this a close yeah. game. Yeah, Houston had more total yards than Texas, coming in at 392 despite the loss. So lots of credit to them. Um, another one in the Big 12, we had UCF at number six, Oklahoma, with Oklahoma pulling away, escaping narrowly with a 31-29 to win. Micah, want to tell us about that? Yeah, Dylan Gabriel beats his old team in Norman. This is a great game. UCF, I think, came out ready to go, looking for their first Big 12 win. Unfortunately, we're unable to get it. And just in overtime, the two-point conversion play call, it was baffling to me. Yeah. I think that's a little bit of something Auburn fans know a bit too well of Gus Malzahn trying to get too cute late in the game yep. going for two yep. and I think that bit UCF I think if you run a straightforward play you stand a chance to win that game but unfortunately would not be the case yeah and UCF coming in six in total offense and Oklahoma coming in at seventh so two big offensive teams here but like you said at the end of the night it came down to who can convert and who can't over to the Pac-12, kind of our favorite conference right now. At Most least, entertaining. Most entertaining, yes. Uh, we talked a little bit about our previous game. So we also had Washington State at number nine, Oregon. Oregon looking for a bounce back win. Uh, they ended up getting it 38 to 24. I think in the past with your Mario Cristobal Oregon teams, this is where you could see them maybe falter, maybe drop one at home versus Washington State and the season unravels. Mm -hmm. However, I think Dan Lanning was able to get them ready to go. They bounced back. They were looking great in those mm -hmm. throwback uniforms. Bo Nix played really well with them for well. 293 and two touchdowns. And Cam Ward is still a very good quarterback. I think because of Washington State's losses this year, people have kind of forgotten about Cam Ward. But... Even though Mike Leach isn't there anymore, this is still a pass-first team, emphasizing the fact they only had 57 rushing mm -hmm. yards. But Ward threw for 438 and a touchdown. Yeah. 
So I think Washington State is still not a team that a lot of Pac-12 teams want to go up against, but a great bounce back win for Oregon to reassert themselves, especially with Washington looking weak this week. Yes, I 100% agree. And I think that's going to have a lot of effect in these future playoff rankings that are about to come out. And finally over to the Big Ten, we had number seven Penn State at number three Ohio State. Game of the week, Ohio State coming out with the win, 20 to 12. Their first kind of close game of the year, despite the Notre Dame game. But um, like this was a big game. I think a lot of Ohio State fans are not going to be happy with me. I still don't trust Kyle McCord in a big game. <laughs> this was so much Marvin Harrison being better than everyone else on the field. And the offense only putting up 20 points. That's not going to cut it versus mm -mm. Michigan. I don't no. care how good Marvin Harrison plays. If Kyle McCord can't spread the ball around, create on his own, I don't think Ohio State is going to be able to beat a team like Michigan or beat any teams in the playoffs. So while I still think Ohio State is a top five team in the country right now, I would still take the teams around to beat them because I still don't trust Kyle McCord. Mm -hmm. And that Penn State defense coming in at first overall in total defense. Um, and you know, we talked about Ohio State's offense. So this was just a big matchup. It was a really good one to watch, too. And like I just talked about a couple minutes ago, is going to have a lot of effect on how these playoff rankings are going to come out. For sure. This Big Ten East is going to have something to say about yeah. the playoffs. Yeah. Yep. So after some conference shakeup, let's head over to Florida Score and draft this week's playoff teams. Micah, you want to get us started? Yeah, so my number one is still Michigan. They look the most complete out of anyone. They went and absolutely throttled Michigan State at Michigan State 49-0. Yeah. I know Michigan State is not very good, but to beat a rival in conference mm -hmm. on the road 49-0 this Michigan team remains the best team in the country in my eyes. And I agree with you there, which is why I also have them at number one, that another, you know, huge blowout win, again, against Michigan State. But still, it's just so convincing. And, I mean, Michigan fans are really happy right now because their team is just dominating. And I feel like we need to give more credit to Michigan. Um, there's, I just feel like there's not a lot of talk about them right now, but I do think that they deserve to be the number one spot, you know, with their performances throughout the weeks. So who would you have right behind them? Right behind them, I did have Georgia, like I do every week. Uh, just not getting the convincing wins that Michigan does um, again I don't think they're gonna win the SEC so that's gonna have an effect on the playoff um, rankings when they come out but I mean just if I were to put Georgia and Michigan up against each other right now I would have Michigan coming out with a win yeah I would as well I also have Georgia number two though coming off a of bye week looking forward to the Florida game this weekend big rivalry game mm -hmm. How they play in that game, I think, will say a lot about this team, especially missing Brock Bowers, how the offense will be able to function without him. But for now, I have to keep them at number two just because they are still undefeated. They do have at least one convincing win with their win over Kentucky a few mm -hmm. weeks ago. Then right behind them at number three, I know it just seemed like I talked them down, but this Ohio State team. The defense led by JT Tuimoloau is amazing. He's an absolute freak off the edge. He absolutely dominated Olu Fashanu, a very good tackle prospect for Penn State. And that performance, if you're not able to contain him, you're going to have a long day. So I think this Ohio State defense is good enough to maybe bail out Kyle McCord when he isn't as good. So for that reason, I have him at three. At three, I have Florida State. I think Jordan Travis's performance this past weekend and just the way Florida State was able to bounce back shows a lot about their team. And we've talked about how they started to have less convincing wins. But I think after their performance this weekend, that offense, that defense, they deserve that number three spot. Then who would you have behind them for your last top four team? Behind them, coming at number four, I have Washington. Not the results. Oh, I shouldn't say result. Not the performance that we expected to see this weekend, but I do think they can win out in the Pac-12, and they've been dominant throughout the rest of the season. I think this was maybe just not their best week, but, I mean, I still have them coming in at number four. I also have Washington rounding out my top four. For me, that win over Oregon is still the most impressive win of the season that any team has. For that reason, I'm going to keep them in the top mm -hmm. four, but they need to make sure that doesn't happen again, like yeah. what happened versus Arizona State. Then my first two out are going to be Florida State and Oklahoma. Florida State, I still think they are a good team. I am not sure that they're a great team. I want to see them play a team like North Carolina that has that high-powered offense because a lot of their wins 
other than LSU are versus teams that do not have a great offense. And week one, sometimes weird things happen. So I still think they're very good, but I just want to see them play another dominant offense and mm -hmm. see if they can keep up. Then Oklahoma, obviously the win over Texas, surviving versus UCF. Dylan Gabriel looks amazing, and they're still undefeated, so keep them at six. At my number five, I have Ohio State. At the end of the season, I don't think they're going to beat Michigan, obviously. So I think they'll still come in at, end up coming in at five. And then, like you, I also have Oklahoma at number six. Um, that win over Texas, I think, really secures them that spot. And I think that this win this past weekend also keeps them there, too. So, as the race to the CFP is getting a lot closer, a lot of teams are having to lock in and prove that they deserve that top spot. When we come back, we'll head over to the pros and talk about yet another crazy weekend in the NFL. We'll see you after the break for more of Paige and Micah in the PM. Welcome back to Paige and Micah in the PM. Let's head over to the NFL where lots of chaos happened again. So we're going to start off with a quick week seven recap starting in the AFC. We have the AFC East. The Patriots beat the Bills. Yeah, that That's was pretty a big. wild game. The Bills are, uh, I don't know about this Bills team this year. They keep saying, oh, this is going to be the year we take the next step. This is going to be the year we take the next step. Bills they Mafia. just look off this season. Do not look consistent at all. I don't really trust Josh Allen as yeah. much as I used to this season, and obviously losing to the Patriots is not ideal. So I want to see the Bills get another convincing win mm -hmm. before I'm able to put them back in the tier of Super Bowl contender. Yeah, losing to the 1-5 and five Patriots, too, I think that's pretty they notable. They lost to, to our striking midnight team from a couple weeks. Yeah, that's pretty notable. Yeah. Um, next in the East, are the Dolphins legit? Do we think so? I do not know, <laughs> which I know is not the answer a lot of people want to hear on a sports talk show, but the teams that they've beaten are combined 8-25, and 25, and the teams that they've lost to are combined 10-4. and four. So they're murdering bad teams mm -hmm. and losing to good teams. Mm -hmm. I don't know about this team. The offense, the throw it to Tyree Kill every play attack only will work for so long. I think you saw that versus the Eagles. They yep. kind of started to figure out how to slow him down in the second half. So I don't know about this Dolphins team. I want to see more from them. Yeah. Moving to the AFC North, we have 2019 Lamar showing up for the Ravens. Yeah, MVP Lamar was back in a big way Getting versus them the Lions. Big win against the Lions. Yeah, you know, last year, a couple years ago, you say, "Oh, you beat the Lions 38 to six. Who ca who cares?" This year, wow, you beat the Lions 38 yeah. to six. Wow, yeah. this Lions team came in with so many expectations to this game. You know, every week it seems like for the Lions, what kind of statement are the Lions going to make? What kind of statement are the Lions going to make? And the Ravens made a statement of their own. Mm -hmm. and Lamar looks amazing right now. Um, a good win for the Ravens. Um, a bad loss for the Lions, unfortunately. Yeah. A lot of hype surrounding them after their performance last week. Not this week. And then the Browns and the Steelers both moved to 4-2 and two with wins over the Colts and the Rams. Yeah, this is a weird Browns team. Deshaun Watson seems injured every other week. Mm -hmm. And you have P.J. Walker sometimes playing well for this team. This defense, though, is the story of the Browns. Although, against the Colts, they gave up over 30 points, and the offense was able to bail them out. Mm -hmm. So you never quite know how it's going to go with this team. Usually it's a defensive battle, but they've shown now that they can win an offensive shootout as well. So I think this Browns team might make some noise later in the season. As far as the Steelers, I do not think they will be making any noise in the postseason. The offense is awful. Matt Canada is bad. They need to figure out how to score on offense if they want to become a legit playoff contender. Mm -hmm. Good for the Browns and Browns fans. I think Steeler fans will end up being disappointed in the postseason. But the AFC South, the Jags take first and are looking pretty good. Do we think they can keep that first place spot? I think they do. The Texans were on by this week. The Titans have now traded away Kevin Byard to the Eagles for a bag of peanuts. That was <laughs> real weird. They got like Terrell Edmonds, a fourth and a fifth round pick. I don't understand that at all. I don't know what kind of dirt Howie Roseman has on the <laughs> Titans GM with the A.J. Brown trade and now yeah. this one. So the Titans look like they're giving up. The Texans obviously are not going to be a playoff team this year, even though they have improved. And then the Colts losing again this week. So I think the Jags have this one yep. pretty easily. Good for Jags fans. And then finally, the AFC West. The Broncos beat the Packers. Another 1-5 in five team to win. What is going on? Yeah, Broncos defense is kind of starting to return to last season form. I still don't think Vance Joseph is the guy, but 
these are wins you have to pick up if you're the Broncos because I don't think you're a playoff team, but if you can at least not be as awful as you were last yeah. year, show some form of progress, I think that buys people like Sean Payton more time. Mm -hmm. I think that buys Russell Wilson more time. So if they can keep this like small bit of momentum going, I think it'll be very good yeah. for them. Um, a win is a win, and they needed a win, so that's pretty good. Also in the West, Micah, your favorite team, team we love to hear about every week, the Chargers. Okay. <laughs> so Chargers had the Chiefs this week, obviously. I did not think the Chargers were going to win that game. However, they showed up. They kept it close in the first half. And they absolutely fell apart. Justin Herbert, I, I love Justin Herbert, but whatever's up with his non-throwing hand injury is really affecting him for some reason. I don't know. He hasn't looked great the last couple weeks. The secondary is horrific. Brandon Staley's supposed to be a defensive-minded coach. He's out here running zone every play. And our corners, Asante Samuel Jr., Michael Davis, they're begging to run man. Michael Davis will be put out a tweet that said, I would love it if we ran more man coverage. That's when you know it's bad, when your corners are protesting the defensive scheme. Listen the to the linebackers players. look lost. Kenneth Murray it looks lost in the field. Joey Bosa's failed to show up. Khalil Mack plays sometimes. I... <sighs> This Chargers defense infuriates me. Brandon Staley infuriates me. He doesn't know what he's doing. He goes for it on fourth and 75 from his own three-yard line. They just have no personality, no fight at all. The receivers, not named Keenan Allen, are struggling, other than <laughs> Quentin Johnson's looked decent at times. Austin Eckler held out for a while, and now he's not playing well. His yards per carry is down so low from what it used to be. Corey Lindsley on the IR has completely wrecked the offensive line. They do not know how to pass block or run block right now now this whole team is just a disaster that feel good to get out of your system a little yes <laughs> every Chargers fan needs to watch that portion that portion of our show <laughs> moving over to the NFC starting in the east the Giants beat the commanders again what is it with these teams I don't think the Giants are as bad as their record indicates I think they're bad don't get me wrong but I think they're not one in five bad I think they are on a similar skill level as the Commanders, and I think that showed in this game. Giants obviously able to escape with the win. Tyrod Taylor not looking awful. Not looking great, but not looking awful. So that's just going to be the fight for last from the division, honestly. <laughs> what a fight. And then the Eagles, you kind of talked about earlier. Uh, they just got a trade. Tell us a bit more about that. So Kevin Byard, the free safety that they've acquired from the Titans, is a perennial all-pro, very adept in zone coverage, great instincts, flies all around the field, is a very sure tackler. And adding him to that defense, whose maybe only weakness was on the back end, this Eagles defense looks very good right now. Think they can go back to the Super Bowl this year? I, especially with how the Niners have been looking the last couple of weeks, I think it would be hard to bet against them right now. Over in the NFC North, we have the Bears, another 1-5 team winning. Tyson Bajan season! Let's go! <laughs> he looked very good versus the Raiders. I don't think he'll be able to keep that up. I think once teams see more film on him, they'll be able to start to figure him out a little bit. But for now, it's a really fun story. Mm -hmm. We'll see if he can keep that level of play up. As Justin Fields remains out injured, the Raiders are not very good. Mm -mm, so I not really. think fun win for the Bears, little happiness for Bears fans for a little while. Then the Vikings beating the 49ers yeah. on Monday Night Football. What a game. Very impressive win for the Vikings. They completely shut down the 49ers yeah. offense of people not named Christian McCaffrey. <laughs> yep. Brock Purdy did not look good throwing multiple interceptions, including one that lost the Niners the game on a potential game-winning drive. Yeah. Uh, Brock Purdy just does – it looks like the league is starting to figure him out a little bit. It reminds me of Kyra Murray a couple years ago when he suddenly started to really decline. Teams kept him in the pocket, started to contain him a bit more. And I think you're seeing defense is really committed to taking away the short throws from Brock mm -hmm. Purdy so he can't really check down as much. And as a result, he's not the type of guy that's going to stretch the field, and I think that's showing. Yeah, do we think the Vikings can make a playoff push? I do think the Vikings are going to make a wild card push this season. I think the Lions are a bit out of reach for the division lead despite mm -hmm. faltering this yeah, week and the a big loss, loss to the Ravens. Big loss. But I still think the Vikings are going to be able to make a wild card push. All right. And the NFC South, we had the Falcons taking the division lead. Big win over the Bucks in Tampa. I have no idea if Desmond Ritter's the guy or not. <laughs> he throws for a bunch of yards. Every, well, not a bunch, but he threw for 250 this week. I think that's a bunch. That is decent. It's but a good amount. 
no support from the run game. Tyler Algier was decent, but B. John Robinson out with headaches this week. But the thing with Ritter is despite the good performance of the air, three fumbles, including one on the goal line. Yeah. So I... I still don't think you really know what you have with him. I want to see him get more time to try to develop, mm. but he's just a weird player. Yeah, no touchdowns, no picks, but three fumbles. That's just an odd stat, mm -hmm. especially coming from him, too. And then finally, the NFC West. The Seahawks sit at 4-2, and two, just behind the 5-2 and two Niners. We've talked a lot about the 49ers. Do you think there's a division race here? I think there might be at this point. The Seattle offense is good until they get to the red zone, then they forget how to play football. But other than that, they have looked very good this season. The Niners are starting to falter, like I mentioned. I think if both teams continue the trends they're on, this could be a very tight division mm -hmm. race by the end of the year. Pretty good one, too. And... Micah, do you know what time it is? I believe it's striking midnight. All right. Give me your team whose time has run out. For me, it's going to be the Packers this week. Jordan Love, I thought he was going to be a good player, and I'm willing to admit when I'm wrong. He does not look good at all, has not figured it out all season, consistently trying to do too much, and because of that, the offense has suffered greatly. Joe Barry's defense continues to look lost out there. A lot of Packers fans want him gone, and frankly, I can see why. The defense looks absolutely listless despite high-end talent in multiple positions, and I think that's completely inexcusable. And now, with the Packers only having two wins at this point in the season, it might be about time for them to fold. Yep. And that closes out our night. Thanks for tuning in to Episode 3, and we'll see you back here next time for more of the sport we love, football. For tonight, I'm Micah Farmer. And I'm Paige Hunter. And this has it's been, been Paige, Paige and Micah, Micah in, in the, the PM. PM.